This is a 13 year old MacBook Pro, yep, straight out of 2011, fully equipped with a dual core Intel i5 2435M that can boost all the way up to three gigahertz, an eye watering four gigabytes of RAM, 320 gigabyte hard drive and a screen that rivals today's retina displays at a 1280 by 800 resolution. Okay, yeah, it's severely underpowered, but what did you expect? Clearly that means it's e-waste, but maybe not. Can this MacBook at the ripe old age of 13 still earn a spot in your backpack or maybe even in your home lab? Well, with a few tricks, I think so. Now I will say for a 13 year old laptop, this still looks pretty decent due to Apple's consistent design over the years. There are some giveaways that show that this thing's not exactly the newest machine on the block with its gigantic bezels and an overall thickness that lets it have a whole ass RJ45 port, which honestly isn't really a bad thing. Overall, it's still in pretty good shape aside from the missing right arrow key. For reference, this is my wife's old laptop that she's kept forever since it had all of her pictures on it. Yeah, she's had this thing sitting around holding like 200 megabytes worth of pictures when I have like over 100 terabytes worth of space in my server rack. But yeah, build quality here is impressive, which isn't too much of a shock since MacBooks have always had solid builds, especially when they switched over to the unibody magnesium design. But it really doesn't matter if it feels good or if the keyboard's nice, if the hardware is underpowered and the software is ancient. But you know what isn't ancient? This video is sponsored by Ugreen and their Nexode power banks. This right here is their 2000 milliamp hour model that can output up to 130 watts all from this light compact form factor. At just one pound, one ounce, it's light enough to carry around and fits nicely in my dainty man hands. With multiple ports, it has the ability to charge all your devices. It can even do 100 watts over the out one port, charging a MacBook Pro up to 43% in just 30 minutes. Oh, and you won't have to worry about wondering what this device is up to because it's clearly displayed on the LCD screen. Look how cute. So whether you're keeping it around the house or bringing it on the plane, the Nexode power bank is sure to keep you juiced up. Check this one out along with their 100 model using the link down in the description below. I'll throw all the specs up here on the screen, but yeah, it's an old dual core i5 with Intel HD 3000 graphics, four gigabytes of DDR3 RAM, a 1280 by 800 display, and Wi-Fi N. Port selection is actually pretty nice though with one gigabit ethernet, full size SD card slot, audio combo jack, and 10 gigabit Thunderbolt. Then uh, two USB 2.0 ports and Firewire. For charging, you'll be using the original MagSafe port, which is okay, cause like it's pretty nice, but also kind of sucks cause I'm sure it's a pain to find these. Clearly the hardware is very lackluster for today's standards. That's obvious, but we can do something about that. The two upgradable pieces of this device are the RAM and the hard drive. Luckily, it's extremely easy too. This technically supports a max of eight gigabytes of RAM, so I swapped out the two two gigabyte sticks for two four gigabyte sticks. I do miss being able to upgrade laptops this easily. Then for an even larger performance gain, I swapped out the old two and a half inch hard drive for a one terabyte solid state drive. I know these specific silicon power drives aren't very good, but I had it laying around and honestly, it's going to be plenty good enough for this thing. So with that, we've already given this machine a bit more of a fighting chance. The next piece of the puzzle is the software. This laptop had OS X 10.11 or El Capitan, which is very, very dated. And to make things worse, the most recent OS that I could even put on here is High Sierra which would have been better, but still very dated and possibly have issues with modern software. For this reason, we've done the unthinkable and I've installed Linux on here. Oh my God, Brett, I saw your Linux challenge. You hate Linux. No, I don't. I even said this in that video. Is Linux on the desktop bad? No, I don't think it's bad. I just think it's bad for me. So while I wouldn't really daily drive Linux on my main machine, I have no problem using it to bring back life to a 13 year old laptop. I went with Zorn OS for no other reason than it being Debian based and the fact that I've been wanting to try it out. I was honestly shocked at how easily everything just worked. No hiccups during installation, all my IO was working and I even had Wi-Fi and audio straight out of the box. It did prompt me to use non-proprietary Wi-Fi drivers so I switched to those, which then broke my Wi-Fi so I switched back. It's crazy how decently this thing performs. 
If it wasn't for the lowish resolution, I'd assume I was just using a modern low power mini PC or something. In terms of actually using it, I mean, I don't have anything revolutionary to say for web apps and consuming media, it's perfectly fine, which in this day and age is probably enough for most people. The screen itself is good enough for YouTube or to let your kids watch something, but the low resolution and off axis discoloration will make even the most modest nerds cringe. And the speakers are, well, speakers. I, I don't know, I'm not an audio guy. They sound like 13 year old laptop speakers, man. I ran Cinebench 6 just to get some tangible numbers to show you and shocker, they're low. Almost like this thing is a 13 year old dual core system. You're also not really gonna game on here cause the Intel HD Graphics 3000 is a bit uh, old and slow, AKA not really supported anymore. I was able to kind of play Portal 2 though, so that's something. I was hoping maybe I could test out some transcoding with Handbrake, but again, too old. So yeah, I mean, you might be able to play some games and probably some older titles, but I don't really care enough to uh, game on here. And it looks like the screen went off. Show everyone what you're made of. Surprisingly enough, if I did want to use this as an actual laptop, the battery is still servable even after all these years. I fully expected it to die maybe like five minutes after I unplugged it, but with my testing, it was getting around an hour and a half. However, even if I wanted to use this as a laptop, I quickly got deterred from that by how hot the bottom of this thing gets. While running Cinebench, I checked the surface temps on the bottom and it was 40 degrees Celsius, which isn't gonna burn you, but it was very uncomfortable. Basically, the real world use case here is limited to anything web-based or an application that doesn't require much horsepower and uh, make sure you don't burn your beans. Here's the thing though, it's pretty unrealistic to use this thing as an actual desktop system. I mean, we just showed that you can, but when you can just buy a cheap laptop off eBay that's a whole 10 years newer and will be much more usable, it's kind of hard to justify. That doesn't mean this is e-waste though. How about we turn this thing into an ass? Whoa, cool, we can share that entire SSD worth of storage, neat. Nope, we are gonna use a DAS or direct attached storage to give this thing a uh, eight drives worth of space. Uh, come out. And we're gonna do it across a USB connection. Whoa, Brett, that thing only has USB 2. That's not fast enough to transfer all my anime. True, we do have USB 2.0, but we also have Thunderbolt. Yeah, OG Thunderbolt at 10 gigabit per second using the mini DisplayPort form factor. I went on eBay and snagged an old Belkin Thunderbolt 2 dock, which uses the same plug. Now it's somewhere, aha, oh yeah. Unfortunately, the USB 3 ports on here are five gigabits per second, but that's fine because that's like 625 megabytes per second, which is good enough for a hard drive array across the network. So directly in Zorn, I created an MDADM RAID array with our dash drives, created a file system on top of that, then made an FSTAB entry to make sure the file system is mounted. And just like that, after three whole business days of building the array, we had a RAID set up. Now it'll be very clear when I show you these numbers that this isn't gonna be the best choice when it comes to a high speed NAS. Our read speeds were sitting around 28 megabytes per second and our write speeds at 17 megabytes per second. That's very slow. So for a production NAS, um, don't do this, but for a backup, sure. It's like my dad used to always say, if you don't have a backup, then um, use an old MacBook with a Thunderbolt dock and a DAS with MDADM RAID. He'd say that every day when dropping me off from school. To make this work as an actual NAS, we need to be able to share it across the network. So I installed Samba, which will let me connect from any machine in the network, whether it's Windows, Mac, or Linux. Of course, you can also use NFS if you wanna go that route. To actually create the Samba share, I needed to create a folder that I wanted to share, then edit the Samba config to create the actual share. It's not a super complex setup, but you'll have to follow a guide if you're not familiar with setting up shares manually. The last thing I had to do was set a Samba password for my Linux user and then we're done. I can now access my MacBook NAS from anywhere on my network and the speed over a wired one gig connection is pretty decent. Note that this was writing to my one terabyte SSD, not the DAS as we saw before, those speeds are pretty low. So we did learn that with fast enough storage, we can saturate the one gig connection. Is this gonna be the best NAS ever? No but it's still very usable and prevents this from being e-waste. 
Another cool thing is that we still have access to the entire OS, so even if it's docked, we can plug in a monitor and keyboard and still use it. Or we can just SSH in and install Docker to run a couple of lightweight containers. I went ahead and did that to run a couple of things like file browser so I can easily access the files on here and then uptime Kuma so this guy can keep an eye on all my other systems in my lab. Both of these are super lightweight so it's no big deal even for a 13 year old MacBook but I'd avoid throwing any heavy use apps on here like larger databases or anything media related. It's just not worth it. So what was the point of all this? Basically to see if a 13 year old MacBook can be anything other than e-waste and I think that I showed it can be. Am I saying to go out and get one of these? No, for the money there are much better options, but if you do find one of these in a closet or at your local Goodwill and you want something to play around on, it's a usable device even in the year 2024. But that's all I have for this one. Let me know what the oldest device you have running in your home lab is. Is it older than 13 years? Let me know down in the comments. But if you like this video, then drop a like and subscribe if you wanna see more stuff like this. I wanna give a huge shout out to my YouTube members and my Patreons. You guys are my super old group of absolute chads and definitely not e -waste. You guys are great. And if you're still watching, you're Thunderbolt 1. Thank you so much and I'll see you in the next one.